Okay, I had to wear a hoodie. I felt like I would get escorted out of the building if I didn't. I did do some research, and Nicole is always looking so chic, and I was like, I'm wearing jeans and a sweater. You'll um, just to, oh, this is like the Thank uniform you. here, right? I'm, I'm fitting in already. Yes, you are fitting in perfectly. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, I think this is a really important topic, and we talk a lot about mental health and all of the different complexities that that unpacks. And in fact, before we got up here today, uh, we were talking about a little experiment that Nicole wanted to walk us through um, about our values and, and how we align those. Um, so can you share a little bit about this experiment that you want us to participate in? I wanted to go back to the data and the science and the research about burnout and mental health because a lot of it felt very squishy and fuzzy. And so I did the largest study ever done on women and burnout. And I found that we're reaching burnout and breakdown levels in unprecedented numbers. Mm. Um, and then I did a social experiment and I asked women to come in for a casting and I had them list the top five things they valued most. So I thought this might be a fun experiment. Um, just shout out the top five things you value. What would be on your list? Family. Family. Perfect. Friends. Friends. My dog. Your dog. Some other women said that too. Great. Help. Sleep. Help. <laughs> Sleep. Your job. <laughs> Google. Money. Money. All the things. Okay. Well, let's see what some other folks said. Yeah, let's cue up the video. Ah. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Nicole Lappin becoming Superwoman. I'm going to give you a whiteboard. Okay. And on it, I would love if you could list the top five things you value. Value. Okay. What did you put on the list? Should I show? Sure. Sure. Yeah. I love food and I love cooking. <laughs> Kids, family, you know. Uh, family sure. and good humor. Why don't you put yourself on the list? Oh. Um, because, well, I didn't, I didn't think about it. I didn't even think to put myself down. It's just I think of others before I think of myself. I think that's what it is. Why did I put myself? Because <laughs> I should value myself. Shouldn't I? But you're right, I should be here. I don't know why I didn't put myself on the list. Do you value yourself? Yes, I do. I wouldn't be able to do any of the things I've done in my life if I didn't value myself. So I know you cannot be um, completely stable rock for somebody else if you're not stable yourself. What would it take to put you on the list? Um, a sixth option, probably. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask you again. What are the top five things you value most? I'll, I'm going to read you the list. This is my new list. So me, first. <laughs> That's awesome. You can't value anything if you don't value yourself. Because who is there to value it? If you can't help yourself, you can't help anyone. Being good to yourself gives you power to be better to other people and make them feel better about themselves and empower them and then it's a vicious circle. How does it make you feel to see yourself on the list? It feels good um, because I know that I do have to t put myself first. Mm -hmm. Seeing myself first on this list makes me really light up. I should give myself more time first before I start giving my time out to other people. I love that. I do think it's important to put yourself on the list, and I think so often times we forget to do that. So thanks for the reminder. <laughs> You're welcome. That's excellent. It's actually so, when I first read that, it was heartbreaking to me that how many of us just skip right past it, how many of us in this room skipped right past that concept. Um, and, and the idea of that gentle reminder of, you know, you know, you were saying, put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Take care of yourself before you can actually take care of others. They don't say that on the plane before takeoff just to waste time, and I basically live on an airplane. It's yeah. totally true. You can't be of service to anyone else if you're crashing and burning yeah. yourself. And if you would have asked me five years ago, what were the top five things I valued? I definitely wouldn't have put myself on the list. Yeah. The top 10 things, I wouldn't have even thought about it. You know, I went on to ask these women why that was, and a lot of them said, it's because I feel selfish. 
Hmm. for doing that. Mm -hmm. And I dug into the definition of selfish, and part of that definition is having concern for your own needs and pleasures. That, right. So I why think, does that have a negative connotation right? to it? What often has a positive connotation, especially for women, is being selfless. And part of the definition of that is having no concern for your own needs and pleasures. And I think that should definitely be the criticism a toxic and message. not the compliment. Yeah. The next time somebody says you're selfish, say thank you. Yes, I love that. Um, let's, let's back up a little bit because for people in the audience who have been familiar with your first two books, um, you obviously have an incredible career very early on. I think you were the youngest anchor on some of these networks. Um, tell us a little bit about your story. So I grew up in a super broken home, first generation American, uh, never read the Wall Street Journal growing up, uh, never talked about stocks or bonds, like maybe Bond Girl was the extent of it. Um, but I just needed to start working early on. My father died of a drug overdose when I was 11. Um, and I was looking for a job in television. And back in the day, there was no YouTube. Um, so I started in small markets in Lexington, Kentucky, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, worked my way up. At at the CBS stations there, and my goal was to be an anchor on CNN. At some of these small markets, the little local newspaper would interview me and say, like, who is this Doobie Hauser? Because I actually started on the air when I was 15. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and I, I said to them, if I could say Nicole Lapp in CNN before I die, I'll die a happy woman. That was like my little sound bite. Wow. And by the time I was 18, I was offered a job on the floor of the Chicago Merck. I went to Northwestern um, by accident. I wanted a job at this little station group's Milwaukee station. And they were like, we don't have a job there, but do you know anything about business news? And I, my boyfriend in high school said he wanted to be a hedge fund manager. I thought he wanted to be in gardening. Like, I was <laughs> clueless. He actually dumped me because I couldn't hang out with his Wall Street friends. Um, his loss. Agreed. <laughs> Fast forward about 10 years later when I was uh, the morning anchor on CNBC, his friends wanted to... Of course. Hang out. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I just faked it till I made it. I needed that job. And when I was 18, I was a business reporter. And at 21, I joined CNN, which is That's crazy. super high class problems to have your dream job that early. Like, I had major imposter syndrome. I sure. never thought my badge was going to work every single day. When I, I still, started. after 16 years at right. Google, I still wonder if mine's going to work sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> then the financial crisis hit, and we all became business reporters again, and then I went back to uh, business news. But, you know, I thought I would be happy at every one of those benchmarks. Mm -hmm. So I thought I would be happy when I got to be an anchor on CNN. Mm -hmm. And the truth was I wasn't happy. And almost immediately, I changed the goalpost on myself. So it was my dream job. Then I got that. Then it became an anchor on CNBC. Then it became another anchor job. Then it became a first book. Then it became the New York Times bestseller list. Then it became a second book. And it was never enough. Mm -hmm. And my brain never got to the other side of balance or happiness. And studies have shown that we actually have this equation wrong. I mean, I certainly did. It's that balance and happiness bring you more success and not the other way around. Mm. It never got my brain to the other side because I kept constantly changing the goalpost on myself. Right. Until uh, after the launch of my second book, I had a complete mental, emotional, physical breakdown that stemmed from burnout and an emergency admittance to the psych ward that made me rethink Whoa. everything and how I was working. And it was at that moment, I didn't realize it, of course, at the time, um, but it became the thesis for this next book that self-care is the biggest asset or liability in your career. And I had been talking to women about getting had in their careers about networking, negotiating, and all these great tools and skills. But at the end of the day, when I was in the emergency room with my shrink and my assistant canceling everything on my schedule, nothing else mattered. It didn't matter right. that I could network. It didn't matter that I could compose an email. Um, that was it. I hit my own personal rock bottom. And so I think that it's the biggest asset because when it's on point, it can actually bring you more success than you imagine. But when it's off, it can bring you to a rock bottom like mm -hmm. it did for me. And the space in the book for Superwoman is not just um, for my legs. <laughs> it's, it's really intentional. <laughs> um, it's to be a superwoman, that woman who puts her oxygen mask on first mm -hmm. before helping others. You know, for so long, I wanted to be superwoman, the character who tried to be it all and do it all and be all things to all people. So ultimately, 
I was nothing to myself. To yourself, yeah. Well, look, I mean, that is a very concise explanation of what I'm sure was a very trying and, and a lot of hard work within that time. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what was going on in that moment? Because I think in your study, you did showcase that a lot of us feel like we're on the verge of burnout, but we somehow also think that's sustainable, which is hysterical. That was the most fascinating <laughs> stat, actually. It's that about half of us think the pace of our lives is sustainable, but we're on the verge of burnout or breakdown, or we've already had one. Like, what gives? So essentially, we're saying we are drowning, but it's all good. Like, nothing to see here. Yeah. Uh, but there's a huge difference between not drowning and swimming. Right. And so what did that look, so so when you were, you know, it sounds like you actually got to the stage where you were drowning. Tell us a little bit about that, because that, that grit of working yourself back up and then thinking, I'm going to put this in a book to help others, like what, how did you get through that? You know, I had all of this childhood trauma that I alluded to that I didn't even know was trauma. You know, I grew up in a chronically a abusive upbringing, and I didn't think that it would ever kick my butt. I thought I could outwork it. Mm -hmm. So I self-prescribed not drugs or alcohol, but work for so mm -hmm. many years. Um, you know, I started working so early, and I never confronted my past. I never confronted trauma that ultimately became a PTSD diagnosis. Uh, I didn't even know folks that didn't go to war could have a PTSD yeah. diagnosis. Um, I got that after I was admitted to the hospital. You know, the psych ward is the great equalizer, yeah. like the subway or the flu. There, <laughs> <laughs> there are CEOs, there are homeless people, there are yeah. Broadway theater stars. It's something that affects all of us in different ways. And you know, we're all more than labels, but once I could have that diagnosis, I had to turn what I thought was my biggest problem into what I never thought it would be as my biggest superpower. Because mm. the truth is, if I didn't have times of intense depression or hyper arousal, not the sexy kind, but yeah. like part of the PTSD, it's in the DSM-5, um, part of that diagnosis, uh, or times of hyper vigilance, and that's when I worked, and that's when mm -hmm. I had this, and created this platform that I'm able to be here at Google talking to you guys. I didn't work at a bank. I didn't get my MBA. Like I went to the school of hard knocks. I just figured it out the hard way. Yeah. And so I needed to, you know, look my problem in the eye and figure out how to turn that into something that could not only propel me forward, but I wanted a guide. I wanted a manual, and I, I couldn't find one. Yep. You know, I was valedictorian, as you mentioned. That girl in that bio sounds super cool. <laughs> exactly. It's on paper. I actually went to Northeastern, so I always have a Northwestern insecurity, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but go Huskies. That, go Cats. I, like, I didn't <laughs> learn with all of the, you know, learn about antidepressants. Mm -hmm. First time I went to a shrink, I wore a trench coat. I thought mm -hmm. there was shame in it. I got these magic pills that I thought would be happy pills. And the next time I felt sad, I would just take other happy pills where I'd borrow my friend's antidepressants. That's so dangerous. That is so, Looking yeah, back. not okay. So, yeah. so dangerous. Yeah. And I didn't know anything. You don't know. Yeah. And so, well, know. there's so much stigma about talking about this. And I've been guilty. We, we do a lot of emphasis on mental health here at Google. And I hope a lot of companies are, are following suit. But, um, I've been guilty of saying things in my own circle where I didn't understand the gravity or even understand the the need for medication and I had heard this mantra and it was in my head and I and it left my lips that was you know meditate don't medicate and it's just like so absurd but we weren't talking about these things in the same way with the same candor now that you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, and how much kind of trauma that could have prevented if we were just having a more open conversation like we're having right now. Absolutely. I would say for years through the launch of Rich Bitch, you know, I wanted to democratize financial content because we didn't learn this stuff in school. Yep. Like we learn ridiculous things like the Pythagorean theorem or how to dissect a frog. Like I have no idea why we need to know that in our lives. <laughs> But why don't we learn how to do a budget or taxes or a business plan? And so I was really preaching that. If I yeah. were in charge of the world, I would include financial literacy in schools. Mm -hmm. And then this happened to me. And I thought I would also include 
mental and emotional wellness. And yeah. I left the hospital. I went into an outpatient program that I talk really openly about. The only way I know how to tell a story is to tell it honestly. So I was like, here we go. Um, yeah. And I took a DBT class, which is dialectical behavioral therapy. And I learned the most basic skills, interpersonal effectiveness, mindfulness, emotional regulation. You know, I would teach that stuff in school. That's affected mm -hmm. my career more than anything else. Yeah, and it's it's really important to, especially as you look at children today, and I, I'm assuming while all this was happening and given your age and your youth, like this is the age of social media. This is the age of, you know, kind of the sheen of an Instagram life and an Instagram, you know, kind of presentation that we're all putting out there of like, I got it, I got this together. And the truth of it is, is there can, there's A, a lot of hustle behind it. They usually don't see the hustle, you just see the outcome. So that gives like kind of this false pretense of what success should be and how hard it is to work toward it. Um, but also, I mean, you, you've talked about the struggle as a public persona with this personal pain. Kind of how did you grapple with that in terms of having to show up, be on TV, you know, be ready, be pithy, be smart, be, you know, all of the things you're known for while you were having these real painful things going on internally. You know, there would be times that I would be crying in the bathroom before going on national television. And I say that my breakdown in the book wasn't a spontaneous combustion precipitated by a single event, but a lifetime of smoldering embers that finally caught fire and incinerated everything in its path. And it's true because I've thought a lot about this, of course. And for me, getting to the other side, I felt like I got through the fire. And what I wanted to do was bring back buckets for those still suffering mm -hmm. in the flames because I didn't have something that I could go to that told me without like, you know, woo-woo meditation stuff, which can work for some people. It can people. work it for some people. It work right. for me. Like, yeah. I, I never understood it. Like, how do you go to a room, pay $30 to sit in silence, like, or download an app uh, to be silent? I have so many questions about this. Yeah. And, you know, I just rethought all of that. So for me, going to random classes is meditative. Uh, yeah. Especially in New York, it's really easy to do that. So like latte art making, um, Beyonce dance class, Fun. <laughs> tomahawk throwing, like the more yeah. random, the better. That's meditative for me. But, you know, I went on the journey myself. So I went from Bali and I went to healers and I went to programs and I went to everything where I was like, oh my God, and this is also really expensive. And I yes. had the luxury to take time off and go on this mission. And so I just started writing notes. Like I said, I, you know, I was good. I was done with a couple of books and I felt like this was a mission that I would have loved my former self to have. So yeah. if I could share any of my story and hopefully inspire others, I think with this type of taboo stuff, somebody has got to go first. So I'm like, I'll show you mine. If you show me yours, you don't even need to show me yours as long as you show yourself. Yes. As long as you can confront whatever that problem is. And we all have problems. And it doesn't matter if they're, you know, girl interrupted level problems like I had. You know, if, it, if it's keeping you from the life you want and deserve, that problem is important. It's, sure. Yes, and it's Pretty real. Neat. Yeah. What I love about the way that you've written your books is that they are um, kind of designed to meet you where you're at, right? So it's not necessarily, because I don't know about anybody out there, but I have a stack of books on my nightstand that are like this, that my husband's like, okay, there's your like self-help, like manifestos, just go in the corner and do your thing, you know? Um, and I never get through them, right? Like I'll read some of them, but it, it, sometimes it's, you buy it in that moment that you think you need it. And then it's not really, you know, the moment that you actually get to it, it's not really hitting the mark. What I like about the way you've structured your book and your chapters and all of your books, frankly, because I do think mental health, you know, satisfaction with your career, satisfaction with your finances, they're all linked together, um, is that these are kind of choose your own adventure type paths, right? You can look at which chapter speaks the most to you and dive right in there. You don't have to set aside, you can you can kind of use it as like a triage moment. What's crazy is that I actually have my own book 
on my nightstand. Um, and I hopefully that doesn't come across as super narcissistic, no. but I actually go back because not only am I the writer of this, but I'm a lifelong reader and I am not perfect. Like I've figured out more balance. And I think we first have to define what balance looks like to us. Mm -hmm. And that changes at different points in our lives. But I constantly have to remind myself of these skills. You know, I was supposed to have this book come out in March um, of last year, and that's because my second book came out March two years before that, and my first book came out two years before that in March. Nobody knew that besides me. Like, I just right. wanted to wrap it in a pretty little bow. But as we were going to the printer, and I don't talk about this um, often, but I felt like I was on the verge of burnout yet again, and that mm. imposter syndrome came back to bite me. And it was years since I had felt that around the time of CNN where I was like, <laughs> is my badge going to work? Is it not going to work? And I was like, gosh, I'm going to go on this press tour and I know what that's like. Right. Talking about balance, I feel like my life is hanging in it yet again. I'm on the verge of the burnout that I talked about. How is this happening? So I stopped the publication. I pushed it out Amazing. six months. I went off the grid. And I reread my own book. And I was like, damn, this is pretty <laughs> good. Who wrote this? Yeah. It looked foreign to me because I got really cocky. I was like, I got this balance stuff figured out. Like right. I went to I went to gurus, I went to Bali, I went to all the things. Like, I got this, we're good, we're done. Yeah. Balance, check that off the list. No, no. Balance is often used as a noun, especially by women, because mm -hmm. it's something you think you find and you're done with. I think it should be used as a verb. It's something that's constantly in motion. It's something you constantly have to participate and be a fierce participant in. And I found, you know, if I got back to that balance stuff after this book tour was done, there was going to be some other project, some other chaos. Chaos is a game of whack-a-mole. When something is done, something is coming up on, uh, right after yes. that, yeah. and you have to whack that down. And I think for me, I needed to come to the realization that balance and chaos have to coexist. Yes. They, in fact, they have to exist together as a duality right. exist in and of themselves. It can't be balance or chaos. And so I just realized that I had a lifetime of bad habits. Yeah. And only a lifetime of good habits was going to be enough to counteract that. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting, too, because you're putting yourself out in such a personal way. And it does seem like, right, from the outside, when I hear that two-year, two-year, two-year cycle, it's like, well, how do you squeeze in a breakdown, a hospitalization, a lesson, a rebound, and writing a book, and then going on book tour? I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I love that you pumped the brakes that you were like, this is actually not what my intention is, um, but also realizing that this is actually not going to land because, like, this wouldn't have been successful had you been out there burnt out, right? Like, so, like, this is, this is the cycle we get ourselves in. And when you say it, it sounds so obvious, but when you're living it, it's actually really hard to stop yourself or see yourself in those cycles. So what are some of the tips, like, I don't need like top five tips for balance, but like, what are some of the tips that really worked for you? What were some of your kind of leading habits that you wish you had seen as red lights sooner than you did? And I aim for progress and not perfection, mm -hmm. certainly. You know, I take a lot of my own advice. I don't take all of it. Uh, when y'all write many best-selling books, please don't read your own reviews, but you will be tempted to. And one of them I read said, Nicole is a do-as-I-say-not-do-as-I-do person. And I'm like, that that's right. Like, I don't do all of this stuff every day. I own that. I'm the first person to own yeah. that. I primarily had to quiet that mean girl inside my head. Mm -hmm. Gosh, we have like a mean girl and a mean guy who says the most horrible things to ourselves. If my best friend messed up at work, would I tell her, you suck, you're the worst, you're going to die alone, be broke and homeless in the center with cap? <laughs> That's exactly what I tell myself. That's yeah. like the the audio tape or the MP3 or whatever that's like playing in my head. It's my greatest hits of like self-loathing. Yeah. Um, 
you know, no, I would say, hey, baby, it's going to be okay. You're the best. It's all good. Let me give you a hug. But we yeah. don't treat ourselves like our own best friend or even close. I actually put a right-handed wedding ring on my finger as well. Um, and that was a big deal because for a long time, I thought a man would save me or a job would save mm -hmm. me. And the truth is, if there is ever a ring on this hand, I will still have the one on my right hand because the most important relationship is the one you have with yourself. And I really needed to not only, you know, like myself, I needed to understand who I was and yeah. understand uh, that this, you know, progress and not perfection is okay. You know, there are days that I start my day not looking at my phone for the first hour, you know, doing my gratitude journaling, which by the way, I feel the difference uh, when I do and when I don't. Oh, interesting. Just do a simple journaling. Um, what am I grateful for? Because it trains your brain to start looking for those moments throughout mm -hmm. the day. Um, and then write down what I want to have as my intentions for the day instead of going down email, you know, firefighting, We've yeah. all been there. Every you just morning. get into yeah. I don't even. Like, well, I can't out. even put my eye drops in, and I'm like reading my email. I'm <laughs> right. like, this is not good. This is not healthy behavior. It and it's not most of the time for sure, right. but it happens. Yeah. And you know, you go down and you go into other people's agendas, and those are great days where I don't do that, or I end my day with more gratitude and not like shining the bright light of my ex boyfriend's Instagram page <laughs> into my eyeball and before going to sleep. I sleep. I <laughs> yeah. wonder why. I can't sleep. Um, but the truth is, like, I, it, as part of my press tour, I went on this one show where they had all the guests say their morning routine because I'm, I'm a big believer in like what the morning and evening routines are because throughout the day, it's chaos. Whether mm -hmm. you work for yourself, whether you work for someone else as an entrepreneur, it, you know, stuff changes all the time. But you can control the morning and the evening. That's, the, that's your time. Um, and the host went around and asked all the guests, like, what did you do this morning? And I thought, oh, this is a good opportunity to talk about, you know, some of the messages in the book. She goes to the first person and he's like, you know, I wrote down the things I manifested and then I ran three miles and drank lemon juice oh, or Jesus. lemon water or whatever. And <laughs> so relatable. Right. <laughs> <laughs> she was actually a great host. She was like, oh, yeah, what are the top five things you manifest? He was like, oh, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, I just look at them every day. And we were like, yeah, BS. Um, the next woman said something like also drank lemon water. Um, I was in L.A. And <laughs> say no more. We love you, L.A. <laughs> my hometown. But I I thought by the time they got to me, I could not lie. I was like, first of all, there's no lemons left in LA because all y'all drank all of the lemon water. Um, but what I really did was I pulled the lash off my eyeball from the night before. I scrolled onto like my ex's sister's dog's Instagram page. Like I downed a venti red eye or whatever. And I just tried to make something out of my life this morning. Yeah. And that's the truth. That's right. really what happened. And so, you know, I don't think when somebody says they're an expert in balance, that's even a thing. You should go the other way. We're all just figuring it out each day. And that, I think, is balance because every day is going to be a little bit different. Yeah. And, you know, you can say that you value money, fame, and success as the things that you're focusing on right now. And that's okay, just as long as you're true to whatever it is you're focusing on and valuing. You just can't do it all. You can't yeah. have it all, I believe, because we've heard these questions, I'm sure, on a ton yes. of panels. Like, can women have it all? Absolutely. Can, if have you, we heard if men can have that all? That's a whole, okay, are you it's inviting a different me back conversation. for a I sure am. <laughs> Part two coming at you. <laughs> but, you know, it's only if you define what it all actually means and to stop you. changing the definition yeah. on yourself. You just can't do it all at the same time. Yeah. I want to open it up um, to the audience if we have some questions. But um, so please feel free. There's some mics out there. Um, and while people are, are stewing or getting up the guts to stand up and ask some questions, I'll, I, I think this is why when you talk about the gratitude, you talk about the journaling, um, we hear this stuff all the time. It is not something that I do. Um, it is something I know my husband would like make fun of me for, whatever, you know, joking and lovingly. But like, it's not, that doesn't speak to me. But what does speak to me is the way that you, what we saw in the video of just this whiteboard, 
of what are the things that are important to you. And that reminder, like if there's something that works for you and speaks to you that you can look at every day, that you can just have that moment of just knowing what your baseline is so that when you're off it, okay, I'm off my baseline, then I can get back. But not like striving toward this perfection goal, um, I think is really important. Um, so what are some other ways that you kind of look at your your schedule and your projects? I would imagine obviously promoting a third book. I mean, you're obviously in demand in terms of having more appearances and stuff. What are some boundaries that you've set for yourself or some ways that you've found to be really successful in setting boundaries when everyone's asking of so much of you? Well, no is a complete sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and there are ways, and I actually write scripts in all my books with these tricky topics. I just write the script because intellectually we know we should be negotiating, whether it's at a car dealership or at work, but we don't know exactly what we're supposed to say. So I'm like, okay, well, let me just break this down um, and create sample scripts. And so you can say no at work. You can say no with your best friends. You can say no with your family or significant other. Um, you know, those might be tricky conversations, but if you don't value your time, nobody else is going to. Right. And what's worse is saying, yes to something that you can't do a great job with. Right. So it's better to full ass one thing than half ass many things and also be really transparent about that whether it's with you know what about folks that report to you if they really can't do a project wouldn't you rather know that than yeah. it not getting done? Exactly. Exactly. And, and I mean I think that's something so you're bringing up the work piece of this too because you know, here at Google and in most companies now, like we are constantly tethered to our phones. We are able to work from anywhere, uh, which is a blessing and a curse. We are, you know, constantly kind of expected to be in response mode and do these things. And I think when you can either get into the mode where you're saying no to all the things that are actually really good for you and really positive for you, right? So if it is a friend that's asking you to go have dinner and you know you're going to have a night of like those hardcore belly laughs, like that's self-care. That's probably the thing you say yes to. Um, but like what, where did it come from, this idea that we can't set these boundaries at work or say, you know what, I need a mental health day or I just need a break? Um, I think we're getting more open to that here, but what are some of the things you've seen in the workforce where we really kind of limit that conversation or the ability to be open about that? Yeah, I think it's also the idea that if you have something on your calendar, like if I had lunch with Bethany, I would think a thousand times before canceling that, mm -hmm. right? But if I, my former self, had a meeting opportunity and I had a workout scheduled in the morning, I would have said, I have nothing to do. Mm -hmm. Now, if that meeting was with Oprah, okay, maybe I did have <laughs> nothing to do. But otherwise, no, I had something to do. I had a date with myself. Yeah. I would have thought a bazillion times before canceling on you and I would have so easily canceled on myself. Yeah. And I think therein lies the problem. Uh, I think you can always get more money Coming from the money lady, you can't get more time. Your time mm -hmm. is your most valuable asset. And I think we've all been in that situation where, especially if you work for yourself, you know, you think if you don't have actual equity, sweat equity is going to mm -hmm. be even better. Yeah. And you stare at your computer until your eyeballs bleed. But there's a point of diminishing returns there. A hundred percent. When you yeah. push and push for that aha moment, your brain yes. is like, ha ha, no dice. Right. You're not going to get yourself there. You know, I, I took a break at the end of the year. So we had a couple weeks off, um, well, the way the holidays fell. And I would say within probably 14 days off, there were three days that I was really able to just chill. Like it took me that long to kind of unwind this and give myself the space to be there. And that's the other thing too, that you can't really shoehorn like, here's where I'm going to relax, right? Sometimes your body will have a different plan for you. What were some of like the physiological things that you dealt with in terms of, you know, exhaustion or other types of physical health? I had chronic hives, for oh, instance. Um, I, had, I was on this super early morning show at CNBC, and my body was just like, I 
hate you. I'm going to give you random pink eye and like <laughs> that you can't go on TV with. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, I think especially as um, you know, a personality or an entrepreneur, like you are your own business card. Mm -hmm. If you're not good yourself, you're not going to be of service mm -hmm. to anyone else. Mm -hmm. Hi. Well, we have a question for us. I just have a question. I want to know what's next for you. Thank you. Uh, it's a great question. Um, you know what? For me right now, people have been asking, where is your next book? And I have tried to say, you know what? I'm going to take a beat on this one. Mm -hmm. Not in two marches from now is there going to be another book of baby. <laughs> there is a, there's no epidural for those. You know, I have girlfriends who have had <laughs> book babies and human babies. And they're like, the book baby was actually harder. It's no joke. I mean, if you really want to create a book that people like, first of all, write a good book. I always say that as advice. And they're like, hello, Captain Obvious. How do I get on Dr. Oz? I'm like, no, no, like create a good product. You can't market your way out of a bad product. Um, so I'm going to take a beat on that um, for right now. Although, um, yeah, and I just really want to take some of my own advice and not feel rushed to put everything in a, in a bow. I didn't think I would be an author. So weird. This is like my job now. Yeah. I thought I'd send it for Hanukkah and call it a day. <laughs> Everybody gets a rich bitch. Well, it's a great, it's Good a night, great sir. reminder that like success happens to you. And if you're not ready to receive it or ready to pivot or ready to just be open to it, that it's going to take a different shape or form than you expected. Yeah. And I think that, oh, sorry. oh no, um, go, ahead. go ahead. Just reprogramming myself. And I think we all can do that to some extent of not having more ideas. You know, I want to be able to make the ones that I have successful. I created a suite of online classes. So the money school, um, the boss school, the balance school that go along with my books. Um, I created a quiz. I have a journal that goes along with this. Like I have so many products that I want to you know, like actually give them enough time yeah. doing well by them mm -hmm. um, and instead of creating more and more stuff. So I've tried to be like, OK, uh, maybe no more ideas, more execution. Yes, I love it. Hey, Nicole, my question is around how you kind of leverage your network and like minded people in the community to really make this stick and also help you on your journey. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I like to think of my uh, network as like my own personal C-suite. And so I think the idea of networking is kind of icky. Um, I, like I said, I knew nobody when I moved to New York. Um, I had family that used cash. Like I didn't know anything about Wall Street. I'm the least likely person to be doing any of this. And so I just met one person who introduced me to the next person. And I tried to create a network. Um, and I always tried to be of service to other people. So when you're writing a book, you ask for a lot of favors. <laughs> like you call in a lot of those favors. And then I just, you know, I'm, I'm good with the favors at this point. I just try to be of service to others. And it's about like really showing up to people's events when they ask. Um, it sounds so basic, but you know, I know what it's like when people don't show up at events. And it's, um, you know, I think that you have to show up for other people. And also I, I like to incorporate them into self-care stuff. So I think a lot of times we hear self-care as being synonymous with pedicures and deep tissue massages mm -hmm. and stuff like that. No, don't get me wrong. Like mama They're loves lovely. a good yes. pedicure and deep <laughs> tissue massage as much as the next girl. Um, but I think self-care is, you know, what we had mentioned before. Going to the doctor, you know, going to trauma therapy, which is like the least fun thing to do. By yeah. the way, there's never a good day for trauma therapy or a colonoscopy, but like sometimes those <laughs> things need to get done. Um, and so, you know, rethinking the idea of going to drinks and doing more, you know, like, Walks or sweat working is, I think, what they're calling it. Sweat working. <laughs> I have not heard that one yet. It sounds very disgusting, but also healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question? Yes. Great. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you so awesome. much. What you have to say is really touching home to me. Thank you. Um, I've hit rock bottom more than once to know that I do value myself. So when you asked that, I actually did say it to myself. I value myself. But I have a problem following through. So I value myself, but what do I do to really help that? I don't really stick to anything. 
Um, and I know you said no, like be good at saying no to things that you can't really commit to, and I have a hard time doing that. Um, I've started to do that a little bit, but what are some other tips that you have to help follow through with doing things that value yourself, and also how do you remind yourself when you forget? Um, it's really good to be like, oh, I did really good this month in working out, and six months it like fell off. Um, how do you, what do you do to help yourself get back on track? Well, you're holding, is that a latte or is it a coffee? coffee? Perfect. <laughs> so, um, so a lot of financial experts will say don't buy the coffee or the morning latte, right, in the beginning of the year. And I think that's the most terrible advice you could possibly give. Why? Is because, you know, a couple months later, people will say to me, I'm so good, I cut out the morning latte every day, but I bought a Gucci purse. <laughs> a financial diet, and along with, you know, prioritizing yourself is a lot like a regular diet. Mm -hmm. If you don't allow yourself small indulgences, you're gonna binge later on. And so I think it's accounting for that fun, whether it's in a, a budget or whether it's in balance. When people say I'm off budget to me, I say, did you even have a budget? What do you mean you're off budget? And when, it's, when somebody says like, I'm off balance, I say, no, truly, like, do you have a definition of what balance is to you? If you look at somebody here who's front of their desk, you know, for 18 hours, like I used to be, do you automatically think they're not balanced? I don't know. Maybe their definition of balance is to focus on their career at that point. And so I created a point system that's like a, the company formerly known as Weight Watchers system um, where you give yourself 10 points for the day. And you list the top five things you value most, which we did already, mm -hmm. and you divvy out those points. And the only requirement is that you give one point to emotional wellness. Otherwise, it will require all 10 points like it did for me. Interesting. And so if you allow yourself at least one point. So for the thick of this book tour, for instance, I was a terrible friend. I miss my girlfriend's, my best girlfriend's birthday party. Like I did not date. I was focused, but I was very clear that I was only focused on that. So I didn't shame myself for the stuff that I didn't do. So I didn't shame myself for saying like, oh my gosh, you're not going on dates. You're going to die alone. Your eggs are rotting. I smell them. Like, no, I, I tried to go <laughs> quiet that mean girl. Um, and you're like, oh my gosh. No, I love it. Google. <laughs> this is so up my alley. Put your yeah. fake flag away, Levin. Um, so, you know, but all kidding aside, I, I really tried to be intentional and clear with what balance was for me. So I have a tattoo here that says there will be time. Um, and I, I got it during the thick of the book tour because there will, will be time for everything you want to do, um, whether it's to have a family, whether it's to you know, have more leisure time, whatever it is. But really, what is it right now? And I think staying true to that is what stays, keeps you on balance. Um, I talked to so many super women um, going into this book, and one CEO of a big uh, cosmetics company said her trick to balance was making a decision. I always thought that was really interesting. Because yes, we've heard a lot of this over and over again, and you figure out what works best for you. But sometimes, like just not making a decision. Decision theory shows that if you have about 70% of the information, make a decision, and then you'll love your decision, because we tend to love our own stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I think, I think about that very often. And I also have dug into the science behind habits. So I point to your coffee, for example, as something that you could also use as a habit forming reward. We often forget the reward part of creating a habit. So there's three parts, a cue, a habit, and a reward. So we don't do a lot of things that we don't get rewarded for. We don't do a lot of hard things we don't get rewarded for. So when you say you're gonna go work out, for instance, the reason a lot of folks don't stay with it is because they forget that reward part. So the cue in a situation like that would be, okay, at 7 a.m. I set the automatic, um, you know, coffee maker or whatever, um, if you're not buying a morning latte, uh, and I smell that. So it, it tells me that I should get my booty to the gym. Then I go to the gym, and then after that I get an almond butter, butter smoothie or whatever as my reward. It doesn't matter what the reward is, but it's really remembering that reward part um, of the habit, which is to keep you motivated. To keep yeah. you motivated, absolutely. Yeah. You talked a little bit about being in that drowning phase and thinking that it's sustainable. I've often noticed I won't know I'm at my breaking point until I'm at my breaking mm -hmm. point. So what are some signs that, and it's probably really personal, but what are some signs that we should be looking for when we're in that drowning phase? 
And then do you have any advice on how to frame the conversation with your manager, or your director, when they're asking you to take on more work, but you feel like you're on that tip? Absolutely. Thank you for both of those questions. Nothing is too personal for me. Um, you know, um, I'm not a doctor. Um, you know, I'm not a shrink. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a girl who fell on her butt and figured out how to get back up. Um, and there's a, a very important difference between burnout, which now the World Health Organization has named a condition, as we know. I didn't think this was going to be a zeitgeisty topic when it came out with this. I thought like saying lean out was going to be really controversial. Apparently, it's not. But I'm glad we're having this conversation because depression, anxiety, burnout, they can have similar symptoms, but they're very different. So I think it's about being very clear on what those symptoms are a professional, of course, if you need to. And one of the big telltale signs of burnout is if you take time off and you come back and you're still exhausted or you're mm. still jaded. If you've taken some you know, vacation time or a long weekend and you still feel that way, you could be on the verge of burnout. Um, and the second question about talking to your manager or talking to your boss about taking on more work, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's important as somebody who has employees myself, um, they do use my advice against me. <laughs> like, I'm feeling so burnt out. I'm like, get back to work. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, it's really important to remind your manager of the stuff that you have going on. Because yes, I have employees, but I'm not... I have my own work. Like I'm not looking at everything they're doing all the time. So, and sometimes I forget like, oh yeah, you had this project and you had this deadline. And so I think it's really important to say like, hey, I would love to get to project B. I have to, you know, I, just as a reminder, I'm working on project A. Um, that should be wrapped up by X. You know, I think it's to, to just bring back um, what may feel obvious to you, yeah. but as a manager, you're dealing with your own stuff yeah. um, and creating, you know, alternative uh, suggestions about when something could get done. So it'd be yeah. like, yeah, you know, I'd really love to be helpful with whatever. Um, I know that you want this by Friday. What about, you know, next Thursday? Yeah. Is that something that we can do? And so, you know, sometimes I will give people a deadline just because we should have a deadline. It shouldn't be open-ended. But right. next Thursday could be fine if you make that suggestion. So I think being really clear about what that is, in the same way as you know, when you're making a meeting, it's always more helpful to cut back on the back and forth. If you're like, I can do Tuesday at 3 or Wednesday at 4, even if you have all the time in the world, it also makes you look like a little bit more of a More specific. Deal. Yeah. Um, yeah, but more specific around that stuff. Yeah, and I think you know, just to piggyback um, on behalf of Google and, and the directors and managers here, like I. I do think saying, you know, at some point there is just going to be too much work for somebody to do or there's going to be too many projects within a single team. And the ability to say to your director or manager, just help me prioritize because I don't want to drop any balls. So I need to know what the most important thing for me to focus my time is on right now. And, and that shouldn't be on you. That is a leadership decision to help walk you through that. Um, because you will inherently as a leader also give your busiest people the work because they tend to be really good at it. And so that's something that unless you're having that two-way conversation can be really hard to kind of see what somebody's you know dealing with inside. So. Uh, I want to thank Nicole. You are a super woman. Um, and thank you for bringing this to us.